So now we're going to move on to mastering the English section again, which is 75 questions in 45 minutes. And I'm going to let a cool take over this part. Thank you, Ananya. So as Ananya said, it's 75 questions in 45 minutes, which to anyone who hasn't taken this test before, or even those who have, that's really daunting to have such little time to do so many questions. But then I remind myself that the fact that they're giving you such little time means that these questions aren't difficult. They expect you to be able to answer them really, really quickly. So they aren't expecting a lot from you. So overall, the process for the English portion of the test is to first identify the topic being tested. So like uh, Ananya, when she was going over the different tests, she said one of the things that uh, is tested on the English section is punctuation. So if you see, in, if you can tell from the words of the question as well as the context that they're testing your knowledge of punctuation, then look solely at the punctuation or mostly at the punctuation of the answer choices to identify which is the best one for that topic being tested. Then if you uh, are confused about some of, you know, some of the answer choices look very similar, then try to find the differences between each. This is a very valuable strategy because oftentimes the ACT is testing your knowledge on the nuance of the language as opposed to what is strictly right and what is strictly wrong. So if you check the differences between each answer choice, even if it's just one small uh, punctuation mark or one word that could make a world of differences in terms of whether it's correct or not. Then <clears throat> eliminate choices that incorrectly execute the rules for the topic that's being tested or that are inconcise, that are way too long and impractical. Um, then use your context clues to read the two lines above and below to see if your answer choice, what you think is correct, matches with the overall tone, flow, and intent of the passage. And then finally, use your ears. Substitute what you think the correct answer is back into, into the sentence and then say it out loud in your mind and see if it makes sense. Um, Ananya? Thank you. Yeah, so there are a few different types of question types, question stems on this section. This section. Of the one important one is context. And so the ACT, as I said earlier, isn't always testing what is correct and what isn't correct, but rather what is the best choice. So there may be multiple good answers, but there's only one that is best or conversely there may be all of the answer choices may be bad but one is still better than the rest so you should uh, when do when doing this test you should try and find which one best answers the question not which one is necessarily good or which is uh, or uh, eliminate those that are bad so um, typically there are two answer choices that are unrelated one that seems right but continues the topic and doesn't necessarily and continues the topic but doesn't necessarily uh, best answer the question and then one that is correct with strong indicators of what the question asks one that directly responds to the prompt then the other type of uh, question type is vocabulary which all you really have to do is replace a vocabulary word with the other options they give you and see which one makes most sense using context clues and maybe even your knowledge of prefixes and suffixes. So as I said earlier and Ananya said, this this test tests your knowledge on punctuation. So one of the main things they assess you on is commas and um, you don't want commas between independent clauses because that is called a comma splice. And instead of put, so for example, if I were to say, I like dogs, comma, dogs are cool. That would be incorrect because you have two independent clauses. That's a run on. So instead of putting a comma there, you'd put a semicolon. Um, you also don't put commas between subjects and verbs. So you wouldn't say I comma like to drive. You don't put them before or after prepositions. You don't put them between adjectives and nouns. Like you don't say um, 
the Burj Khalifa is a tall comma building. That, that would be incorrect. Or between adjectives, you can't switch. And this is oftentimes confusing, but you have to learn the nuance of English and adjectives to be able to determine which adjectives require commas and which don't. So the big red house doesn't require a comma because you can't, saying the red big house would be incorrect. And you also don't put commas before an open parentheses um, or between two clauses with the same subject where the subject isn't being repeated. So when you say London is a big city but has modern buildings, you don't need a comma because the but isn't acting as a co uh, conjunction in that case. Um, Ananya, I think you skipped the slide before that. So yes, thank you. You do use commas before fanboy conjunctions. So for, and, nor, but, or, yet, or so. Um, in between a dependent clause and an independent clause. And so you can tell whether a clause is dependent if it starts with a subordinating conjunction like although or before. So you could say something like, although I like dogs, comma, I like cats more. And that is an effective um, illustration of a dependent clause starting with that subordinating conjunction and then a comma and then your independent clause, which would stay um, if you so. Yeah. Um, and you also put commas around non-essential clauses, which are for those of you taking um, AP English, which is most of you, I assume this uh, is mostly an 11, a test 11th graders take. Uh, you put commas around non-essential clauses. Um, OK, you also have colons, which are used between sentence fragments and complete sentences, as well as complete sentences and complete sentences. So you could have an independent clause colon dependent clause or an independent clause colon an independent clause. You also put col uh, colons before lists if there is no introductory phrase present. So I could say. Um, I'm going hiking and I am bringing many supplies, including fire. Uh, I mean, yeah, fire fired like torches, wood and a tent, or you could say I'm going com camping and bringing my supplies colon and then list your supplies out. And so in that case, because there is no introductory phrase like including you don't. Um, you, you, you can use a colon and then you also use colons be before explanations. Then you have semicolons which you put between complete sentences and independent clauses. They have similar functions and placements as periods. Their only difference is that they serve to soften the sentence or create a more effective flow between clauses. You also put them typically before conjunctive adverbs, which are however eventually and those sorts of transition words. Then you have dashes and dashes are very versatile punctuation that can replace periods, semicolons, colons and commas. They can used in they can be used in virtually any context. Uh, one of their main uses is to put them uh, around non-essential phrases though or uh, and you can do the same thing with commas. These are just uh, parenthetical phrases that are not necessary to understanding the passage but are additional information. And then you can also use dashes before a list or explanation. I need to continue with browser. I'm in it. Excuse me, I think someone is unmuted. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then you also have apostrophes. So apostrophes are sometimes tricky, but there are just two or three basic rules. For nouns ending with an S, you add you have the noun apostrophe S. For names ending with an S, it doesn't really matter. You can say James's with the apostrophe at at the end or James with James apostrophe S in the context of James's car. And then you add apostrophes and contractions. OK, so for the test. There are a few general rules of thumbs of thumb you need to know. One is conciseness. The test will really try and. Assess your understanding of conciseness and see whether you know how to make sentences. Um, 
more concise without detracting from the meaning or the intent of the passage. So yeah, concise is nearly always better than wordy. They'll assess your knowledge of direct and in, uh, direct object um, pronouns and subject pronouns. So remember, it's me. This, the pronoun is me if it's after a verb and it's I if it's before a verb. So you'd say I found something. And in that case, I is the subject. Or you could say something found me in which something is the subject and me is the direct object. Make sure that punctuation is kept inside of quotation marks. So if you have a sentence or something, then the period should go before the ending quotation mark, not after it. And this applies in all cases, except if you um, you're trying to quote a title or a proper noun like the office. This question is, have you seen the office? And the question mark comes after the quotation mark because it is um, a proper noun and a title. So answers with the word being are almost always incorrect because that makes the, the answer choice passive and also it's often less concise than the alternative. And good answers have parallel structures. They have the same format of all verbs ending with ing and all nouns ending with I uh, with ism or if not ism or ing, then other things. So if your sentence starts in past tense, it should end in past tense. If it starts um, in the future tense, it should end in the future future tense. There shouldn't be a discrepancy in the verb tensage or the formation of nouns. So um, one major tip for finding answers is looking for identical answer choices to eliminate. So oftentimes, as I said earlier, there would be two or, two or three answer choices that are very similar. And what you have to do is find the nuance within them or see which one is unlike them. So if two answers have punctuation or words that work the same way in the same places, then you should assume both of them are wrong, like a period, a semicolon, and then um, a subordinating conjunction with a comma fulfill the same purpose. So if you have answer choices that are like that, then chances are they're all wrong. Same with next and then and thereafter, they're, they mean the same thing. So if you have answer choices that, ref that have those three words, then chances are all three of them are wrong. So another thing you need to make sure is that your answer choice has subject verb agreement. So all pronouns and verbs must match in terms of number, gender, and function. For example, if I were to say, um, you was watching TV, according to the ACT, that is incorrect. You and was don't match in terms of subject verb agreement because was is a singular verb and instead of was, you'd use were, the second person form of, um, of the verb. Always make sure that the subject, the verb, and the object agree with each other, especially in changing sentence structures. So like, make sure that they match throughout the sentence, if, whether the sentence has a dependent clause and then an independent clause, an independent clause, or a dependent clause, or whatever the construction may be, and as it changes. Then know how, uh, singular and plural nouns work in terms of, for example, the word leaf, leaf. Leaf, when you make it plural, is leaves. So just know those basic English patterns and structures for converting nouns from singular to plural. And then there are some irregular verbs that change differently, but for the most part, if not all part, those who have been raised in an English speaking country who speak English well don't really need to study this part because they're not going to test you on especially different difficult nouns that you you have no way of knowing beforehand. So singular subjects have regular verbs that end with an it, s like is or was. They include collective groups like the family. Oftentimes people get confused with such collective nouns because they think it refers to more than one thing. Like the family has multiple people. And so, yes, if you were to say the people 
then it's plural, but there's only one family. The family has multiple people, but there's only one family, so it's a singular subject. So when you try to find a verb for it, use a singular verb, not a plural one. Use uh, singular subjects, use words like each, every, and neither. The, the ACT really loves testing people on this uh, concept, on each, every, neither, and these types of words and how they relate to the subject of the sentence. So make sure you understand how they function and how they operate in, in this type of construction. And then singular subjects have the pronouns of it, itself, and its. Notice how the its doesn't have an apostrophe. That's because it apostrophe s is it is, not its. So that is also something they will assess you on. Plural subjects have regular verbs that do not end with an S, like are or were, and then pronouns are they, them, their, and themselves. Then there are also many common confusions and those types of frequently made mistakes that the ACT assesses students on, like their versus their versus their, in which case T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E means they are. T-H-E-I-R is the plural possessive pronoun, as in um, I listen to the Beatles, I like their music. And then there is T-H-E-R-E, -E, which is a place, like I like to go there. Then there's whose versus whose, in which who, whose with an apostrophe S is who is and whose, as in W-H-O-S-E, is the possessive of who, as in whose jacket is this. Then, as I said earlier, there is its versus its, I-T apostrophe S is it is, and I-T-S is the possessive of it. Then, uh, some other mechanics that you, are, you should know to find the best answer choice is modifiers. So phrases that describe something must be closest, physically closest to what they are describing. If there is an answer choice in which a noun and the adjective that describes it are on opposite sides of the answer choice, then you know that that's not the best answer. That's not, that doesn't make sense and it's not clear language. Then for adverbs and adjectives, check for superlatives, so more and most. And then if an answer choice has a reflexive pronoun, so myself, yourself, himself, as a subject where there are two subjects, remove the other subject and test if it makes, self, uh, makes sense. So if I were to say, I hurt I, that doesn't make sense. So instead you would try and put myself, I hurt myself, and that is a correct construction. So whenever you have these answer choices with self, just replace the second subject with that self to see if the sentence makes more sense. So I know I said a lot, and that's because this English section does cover a lot of content and a lot of questions, but the main message you should be getting is that all of your answer choices should not only be correct, but they should be concise, consistent, and relevant.